All right, Genesis chapter 18. Now we had a week off due to illness from last week, but we're jumping right back into chapter 18. If you remember chapter 17, just to bring us up to speed since it's been two weeks, is when Abraham received the sign of circumcision and we really covered everything about that and God confirmed he was promising a son of his, of his loins, not Ishmael, that wasn't the son of promise, but Isaac was going to be born. So that was what we went over in chapter 17. So now in chapter 18, it's very interesting here, we see what I believe is an old, one of the Old Testament appearances of Jesus Christ. Now look at, if you would, at verse number 1. It says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. So it says here that God appeared unto Abraham. But how did he appear to him? He appeared to him as one of the three people that, that, that came by his, by his house. Look at, look at uh, we'll keep reading verse number one. It says, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So Abraham is, is hanging out. You know, it's the, it's the hottest part of the day. He's hanging out it was just inside the door of his tent, right? And it says he lift up his eyes and looks. So he looks up and he sees, it says, and lo, three men stood by him. So all of a sudden there's three men right there. He looks up his eyes, there's, there's three guys standing there. And it says, um, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So he goes out, you know, they're out in his front yard or wherever, you know, his three guys come up. He runs out, he meets them, he bows himself down to the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, you shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Now, I want to stop here and just point out this great hospitality of Abraham. He sees these three guys, right? I mean, it's the, it's the hot part of the day. He's relaxing. He sees, he's sitting in the door of his tent, and he sees these three guys coming. He runs out to meet them. He greets them. He bows down. He's just like, Okay. Come on, you know, come on in, have a seat. You know, I got this tree here, sit down in the shade. I'm going to get you a drink. I'm going to get you some water. You could wash your feet. You could, you know, wash up a little bit and I'm going to get you something to eat. He's like, then you could continue on your journey wherever it is you're going. But, but just, just stay here for a minute. Let me take care of you. And this, Abraham has immense hospitality. I'm going to um, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Obviously, we'll be coming back to Genesis 18. But being hospitable is a very important attribute or quality that we should have as Christians. This is something that if you don't already have it, you should, you should strive to be more hospitable, to be more, more you know, open and pleasing and you know, welcoming people in, welcoming people into your house to feed, you know, whatever. When there's you know, strangers, visitors, we have guests in church, whatever it may be, hey, offer to take someone out to eat, do whatever you can. Now, you know, I know we're not all rich and have tons of money, but whatever you can do, uh, you know, what, whatever it is that's in your, your power to be, to be capable of just being hospitable and nice and friendly to people is how we ought to be. Abraham was a great example of that. You're in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. We ought to be given to hospitality, to, to being able to help people that come out. If, um, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Or actually, turn, if you would, to Titus. Titus chapter 1. I'll read for you from 1 Timothy chapter 3. These are the qualifications of a bishop or of a pastor. The Bible says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So there we see it again. A pastor of a church ought to be someone who's given to hospitality. And obviously, I think you could see why. Right? The, the, the pastor or the shepherd who's trying to, 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 to take care of the flock ought to be welcoming and, and being able to, to, to get people to, to congregate together and, and to become part of the church. And in order to do that, you know, one of the important attributes you ought to have is being hospitable. That's why we always, when we have visitors, we always offer, hey, let me take you out to lunch. Let me take you out to dinner. Let me, you know, what can I do for you? And try to help you out and just be very hospitable. You know, people are sometimes just visiting in town. Hey, yeah, have you checked out this? You know, just trying to help them out with whatever it is that they might need help with. That's being hospitable. Um, 
You're in Titus chapter 1, look at verse number 7. This is again talking about a bishop, some requirements of a bishop. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Again, we see that same qualification, lover of hospitality. Now, you might say, that, look at this and be like, well, you know what, that's just for the pastor. Well, hold on a second. Now, these are requirements to be a pastor, yes. So if a person doesn't meet these qualifications, they are not qualified to be a pastor. But don't you think that, I mean, this is just a certain criteria that God's setting up that, well, if you're going to be hold that type of position, you need to hold these. But these are all things that every Christian should be striving to be anyways. Even if you're never going to be a pastor, these are all good attributes and qualities that God wants us all of his people to possess. All he's saying is that, well, if you don't have this, then you can't be a pastor. It's more of just limiting who can be a pastor, but would to God, everybody would have all of these, these types of requirements met uh, uh, as far as the character, sober, holy, just, temperate, you know, all of these things we should all be striving to have. It's not just for the pastor. It just means that if you don't have these things, you can't be the pastor. First uh, Peter chapter four, Look at 1 Peter chapter number 4. Just a little bit further in your Bible from Titus, 1 Peter chapter number 4. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I love that fervent charity. Charity is is a type of love. Like you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the charity chapter. And, and it talks about how great of a love that is. It's a love where you're, where you're doing things for others and it's coming straight from your heart that you honestly care about people. And here you have a fervent charity that, that you're more concerned about them. And this is real similar to what Brother Stuckey was teaching on Sunday night about loving one another. It ties in hand in hand with that being hospitable. You're showing your love for other people when you're being hospitable towards them, when you offer to do things for them, when you when you offer to, to make a meal for them. Hey, come in. You know, we've got an extra room. And, and I know, um, I, I thank God for the for the wonderful church members we already have where people have often offered up, hey, we've got a place. People could stay with us. You know, we're always putting guests up here. Um, that's being hospitable. That's what we need to do. This is exactly how Abraham was. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to keep reading here. Look at verse number 9. It says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. So we ought to have the right spirit about being hospitable. It's not like, oh man, there's people visiting again. All right, well, this food was going to just be for us, so I guess we'll just give them some too. That's being with grudging. That's, that's saying, eh, I really don't want to do this, but I guess I'll just do it because I have to or something. When we're being hospitable one towards another, we should not have that grudging type of an attitude, holding a grudge like, well, I'm just doing this because I have to. We ought to be more than happy when people come here, people visit or whatever, other, especially other Christians, other believers. Hey, you know, it should have more of an attitude like my house is your house. Come in. Help yourself. Get something to eat. Get something to drink. And don't even worry or stress or fret yourself about it because this is what God is commanding us to be like. Don't grudge about it. Don't, don't be like, oh, I have all this hoarded away for myself and it's just for me and it's not for anyone else. We should have a, a very open type of, of, of love for each other where you can be able to give and, and, and provide for other people and not have a grudging attitude. Verse number 10, As every man hath received the gift... Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And one of the things I take away from that verse is that, look, all good gifts, uh, um, every gift, every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. So all the things, really, if you, if you want to boil it down, that you have, ultimately are blessings and gifts that are given to you from God. I mean, yes, you work for them. Yes, you, you, know, you work hard. And, and, and earn this stuff, but God, like for, for me, for example, God's the one who's given me the abilities and skills that I have and the job that I have, and, and he's made a lot of things work out in my life to where I could keep the, the job that I have and provide for my family. Do I have to work hard for it? Yes, but ultimately, God, if, if he sees fit, can make this stuff all vanish and disappear. So I'm not going to hold on to it and be so proud as if this all belongs to me and have that, that, that type of an attitude that's just self-centered. I'm going to be more like, 
hey, great, I have the ability to help other people out and to esteem others better than myself. This is, the, this is an overarching theme. Brother Stucky mentioned, as I already said, on Sunday night sermon, and I mentioned it in a previous sermon as well, on, on um, having this type of an attitude. And it can be difficult sometimes, but we need to overcome our flesh and have a spiritual mind where we can be hospitable one towards another without grudging. I mean, Abraham didn't hesitate. These guys show up. He's like, whoa, hey, come over here. Sit yourself down. I'll get some, I'll get some water for you. Wash your feet. I'm going to get some food ready for you. He goes, and we're going to see in a little bit. He goes and has a calf killed. He's like, honey, you know, start making some cakes. Start making some bread. You know, you do this. He's getting the, this calf killed. And now Abraham did have some wealth, but he still, I mean, he didn't even think about it. He's not sitting there counting the cost. Well, how much is this going to cost to me? He just does it. Like, hey, let me just take care of you. Hebrews 13, you have to turn to verse 1. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis 18. Hebrews 13, 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. And I love this verse. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You never know. When you're really hospital, you never know who you might be being good to, right? And in this sense, it's not, it's not abundantly clear that Abraham knew right off the bat that this is the Lord, right? These were angels and Jesus Christ coming. It's not abundantly clear that he just automatically knew who that was from when they were you know, out when he ran to meet him. I have no indication that says he knew that because this is saying that unawares, just because of the fact, and you know, they could have just passed right on by him, but instead he got an opportunity to, to, to hang out and meet and have, you know, serve a meal to, to the Lord Jesus Christ and to these two angels. Like what a great honor and blessing that is in and of itself. He's saying you might be doing that unawares. And that's what it says to a stranger. It's a foreigner. It's someone, you know, some visitor that comes in. Hey, offer to be hospital. Offer some food, whatever. You know, they, they've come in here. You don't know who that might be. That could be an angel from God, for all you know. And it's all the better for you when, you, when you're being nice to, to God's people and, and, um, and taking care of them like that. But let's go back to, to um, Genesis 18. We'll keep reading here because, um, you know, he tells them all to sit out. I'm going to get you some bread. You know, just rest yourselves. It's hot. Cool off a little bit, take an ease, and then and then when when you've had enough, then you can pass, keep keep going. Verse number six says, um, and they agree to that at the end of verse five. They say, "So do as thou says." So okay, you know we'll, we'll do this. Verse six it says, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, "Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth." And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good. And gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And when you look at what he's doing here, he didn't spare. He didn't give them like the cheap stuff, like, oh, well, we've got this, this can of, of mixed vegetables and these SpaghettiOs that have just been sitting on our shelf for three years, you know, we'll give that to these guests. That's not how Abraham dealt with this. He got, he got, uh, what does it say? He got a herd, a calf, right? A tender and good calf, a good, you know, no one likes to eat chewy meat. He got a tender, good calf, had it, had it dressed, had it killed and, and prepared, you know, threw that on the grill and, and, and cooked up some meat for him while his wife was baking cakes. And he brought them butter, milk, you know, all good things, good quality stuff he's feeding to his guests. And then he stands there. It says he stands there basically as an attendant while they're eating, you know, as, as their, their servant and is serving them and just, and just stands there. Oh, you know, can I get you a napkin? Can I get you some more milk? Can I get you know, whatever? Like that's what he's doing. He's standing there for them. And um, again, this, having this type of an attitude, you have to be humble. You can't have the attitude that says, well, Oh, you're coming in here to serve me, right? Oh, who are these guys? Or, or, you know, there's so many people these days now, it's like they have all these no trespassing signs up and stuff, and they're like, what are you doing knocking on my door? Didn't you see the sign and all this other stuff? Like completely 
inhospitable. Can you imagine if, if Abraham had this big no trespassing sign out on his tree in front of his house? He would have missed the Lord and, and these two angels coming to meet him. They would have been like, well, I guess this guy doesn't want to, want to see anything. You know, doesn't want us to, to visit him. But you just don't know. And oftentimes those people, think about how foolish this is and how sad this is that in many cases, those people might just die and go to hell because they put up all these signs and when someone was going to go and knock on the door and just and bring them salvation, bring them a free gift and just try to explain how they could be saved, they already rejected it by just saying, nope, we don't want any. Don't, don't talk to me about this. But we ought to be a hospital. We ought to, we ought to be able to entertain strangers and in so doing, um, you never know, you might entertain angels unawares. But uh, let's keep reading here. So where are we at? Verse number 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Um, so we see here that you know, God's telling him, You're going to have a child. And, and next year, according to the time of life, I'm going to return and you, you know, Sarah's going to conceive seed and you are going to have a son. And this is, you know, they're both kind of just, it's kind of odd to them, especially to Sarah, because it already had ceased after the manner of women. Like she wasn't, she was well past her childbearing age, right? Just, and I'm not going to get into detail just on the, on the woman's anatomy and how the body works, but after a certain point, after a certain age, the, the, the female body stops producing those eggs to be fertilized to have children. It, once you get to a certain point, that stops happening. And Sarah was well past that point. So they're both kind of thinking, at least physically thinking like, how in the world is this going to happen now? Like, it's impossible. In their eyes, it's impossible for Sarah to have children. She's not producing that egg anymore. How can she possibly have a child? Her body is just simply not functioning that way anymore. And this goes similar to what we were talking about a little bit earlier about soul winning. You know how a lot of people don't realize that children truly, truly are a blessing from God. God is the one that opens up the womb. God is the one that closes the room. And this just confirms that fact. Now, was this a miraculous event? Yes, but God is still the one that provided those children. You can try all you want, but if God doesn't open up the womb, it's not going to be open. God is capable of closing the womb. He's capable of opening the womb, regardless of age, regardless of, of a lot of things. I mean, you think about even with the Virgin Mary. She was a virgin, right? Another impossible birth happened, but Jesus Christ was born of a virgin because God opened up her womb because God is the one that allowed her to conceive of the Holy Ghost. And um, it's the same thing here. Sarah is being allowed to have a child. Now, this is of the seed of Abraham, but God is the one that's opening up the womb. And one thing I want to point out there too, it says, um, and again, I want to get graphic here, but um, well, one, first I'm going to point this out because there's a verse in the Bible and I didn't have this in my notes but I, but I thought about it when I, was, when I was reading the chapter where it talks about in the New Testament about Sarah being a godly woman and it says that she called her husband Lord because she respected Abraham calling him Lord and this is the reference to when Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now, what does it mean? What does Lord mean? Just that, that, name, that word Lord. It's like the boss or your master, or, you know, the person in charge, right? That's who the Lord was, the Lord of, you know, of, of the house or whatever is the, the man that's in charge and running everything. Just like God's name is the Lord. I mean, he's the boss and in charge of everything. But the Bible explains that Sarah was a, was a good wife 
and she respected her husband so much that she called him Lord. Now, what's really interesting about that is because this is the point when Sarah does call Abraham Lord, but it's not audible. Look at what it says in um, verse 12. It says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because Sarah didn't just say it in a way that like, so other people can hear, oh, I'm giving respect unto my husband. This is how she thought. This is how she felt because it's on the inside. Inside, when she's thinking about her husband, she said, my Lord being old also. She had the respect on the inside. And that is an amazing thing. She was a, that's one of the reasons why she's praised as such a godly example of a woman is because she fully embraced her role. And um, it says here that, that, you know, it says uh, Sarah laughed with, within herself. Now, I also want to point this out too. It says, after I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. When she's talking about having pleasure, it's not talking about having a physical relationship with her husband. Because I believe that was probably happening just like a normal relationship would, even, even though they're old, they're having a regular uh, um relationship but the reason why I don't think it's talking about that is because in the next verse verse 13 it says and the Lord said unto Abraham wherefore did Sarah laugh saying now God is going to restate what Sarah just said Sarah just said after I am waxed old shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also God quoted that as shall I of a surety bear a child which am old so he replaced having pleasure with having a child so when she said, shall I you know, have pleasure, she's talking about the pleasure of having a child, the pleasure of having her own son to, to nurture and raise and bring up and all the joy and everything that comes with that. That's the pleasure she's referring to. I just want to point out um, because it's, it's very clear when you read that second verse there of God point out. Now, um, what I love, I love this phrase in verse 14, this question really. Because this is still God speaking in verse 14. He says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But think about that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the more you think about that, the more amazing it really is. Because we truly say, and we truly believe, we have a very powerful, almighty God. God is almighty. And all powerful and it's easy to say that and it's easy to just kind of brush over it and just be like yeah of course God's Almighty but start thinking about the specifics what does that really mean in this specific case that means that even Sarah who's 90 years old is capable of having a son because God's able to do it because to God that's nothing it's no sweat no problem we would boggle our minds thinking, how in the world can a 90-year-old lady have a child? That doesn't even make any sense. Her body can't even handle it. How is she going to produce milk? How is, she, you know, how is all these things going to work? And we can worry and fret ourselves over that. Hey, look, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. We have a very, very big, powerful God. And this is just like we were talking to those Jehovah's Witnesses today. And the guy's like, well, this just doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. How can God become a man? Because we serve a very, very big, powerful God that is even capable of taking on the limitations of a human being, even though nothing can contain God. Even though God is so big and powerful that the whole universe can't contain him, he was still had the power to restrict himself and conform unto the image of a man and, and, and be made in the likeness of a man. Because God can do anything, even take on the limitation of a man. The God that can't do that isn't all-powerful. Our God can do that. This is important to remember because we go through a lot of things that can be difficult in our life. You face obstacles that seem to be insurmountable and seem to be impossible and you wonder how in the world is it, can, 
I get through this? How in the world can I deal with this situation? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Is anything too hard for God? And you know, a lot of people will scoff at you when you tell them that you believe the Bible and that you believe that God literally created everything in existence in six literal days, right? Simply by speaking, think about this, simply by speaking them into existence. Yeah. God didn't even have to raise a finger. He didn't have to get out a hammer and a nail and, you know, and start building stuff and start sweating. And, you know, like, like when we build stuff, when we create things, when we work, God said, let there be light. All of a sudden there's light. That's the power that God possesses. And people will laugh, oh yeah, yeah, you need some fictitious person to, to try to explain everything. No, I don't need it. That's just the truth. That's what happened. I don't need anything to, to, to understand or to help explain things. It's just the truth. Amen. We're going to go through, turn if you would to 2 Kings chapter number 20. I'm going to go through just a few examples of some miracles that God has performed when people have like, tested God or, or asked for a sign from God, just, just showing the, um, you know, how powerful God is. Sit over there. Because God really works in amazing ways and every once in a while he proves himself just so that we could remember and just so that we could know, yeah, we shouldn't try to limit God. And oftentimes, you know, God is, because God is fully capable of doing all kinds of miracles, it's us that puts a limitation on God because we don't have the proper faith because we're not even thinking or believing that God is capable of doing these things when he totally is. 2 Kings chapter number 20, verse number 8, we're going to see Hezekiah because Hezekiah was sick and it was told him by Isaiah that, that you know, he was going to die. And he got sad and he got upset. He wept before God. He prayed to God, God, you know, remember all these good things that I've done. Please don't kill me. You know, like, I, I don't want to, I'm not ready to die yet. And God, you know, turns around. He tells Isaiah, okay, tell him that he's, he's I've heard you. I've heard your prayer. You're not going to die. I'm going to give you 15 more years. And um, we're going to see here, Hezekiah asks, well, how do I know that? Right? Look at verse number 8 of, of 2 Kings chapter 20. It says, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he, excuse me, hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Now think about, if, if you didn't catch what happened there, um, we don't use this anymore, but the, there's sundials that, that tell the time, right? And that's what he's talking about, the dial of Ahaz. So when the shadow hits the, the, the different areas, that tells you what time it is based on, on where the sun is and where the shadow is. So he's saying, okay, 10 degrees. Should, should God change it this way? Or they go forwards or backwards? He's saying, it's nothing for God to make it go forward 10 degrees because it's already going forward anyways. He's like... Have God reverse time for 10 degrees. Let's, let's bring it back. And, um, and he does it. And that's, now look, if it went forward or backward, that would be an amazing thing. And I don't care, a lot of people use, you know, this type of, of verse to prove um, geocentricity which I'm open to that. I'm not dogmatic either way on heliocentric or geocentric uh, models on how, this, uh, on, on how um, our solar system operates, uh, whether, whether the sun revolves around the earth or the earth revolves around the sun. Um, uh, I've, I've looked at both of them and they both have uh, very credible uh, points. But either way, it doesn't matter which model you look at, because the, re and the reason why people think that geocentricity is true based on the Bible is because there's all this talk about the sun doing all the movement. You know, the sun going down, the sun coming up, and everything else. So they say, well, if the sun's actually doing the movement versus the heliocentric system says the sun is stationary and the earth is what's doing the movement around the sun. Um, 
But in any case, let's say take the heliocentric and just, just to give the magnitude of this, right? Let's just say the heliocentric model is correct. The Earth is traveling around the Sun and the Earth is spinning, right? The Earth spins once in a 24-hour period and that's what gives us our, as it goes around the sun, supposedly, and that's where we get our seasons from and their year and everything else. So as it's spinning, in order for this to happen, it would have had to stop spinning and go back. Right? That's a pretty amazing event. And this is another reason why people say, oh, well, the earth's not spinning because in this miracle, you know, like, think about everything that would happen if the Earth stopped spinning and went backwards a little bit and then was set back in motion again. But you have to understand as well, I don't fully buy the argument because this is no doubt a miracle no matter how you slice it, right? So, so whether, whether it was stopping the spinning and turning around or whether the, the sun was literally moved, if the, if, if the Earth's at the center, and the sun's moving around the earth, okay, then the sun had to stop its, its orbit and would have to go backward, which would have all kinds of other ramifications on, you know, magnetism and, you know, I mean, just the pull, the gravity, every, you know, all kinds. Of, there's so much involved in these miracles. But to God, it's nothing. Nothing. We can't even comprehend all the ramifications of something like this in the physical sense. In the real world, right? In, 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 well, I call it the real world, but what God does is the real world. But in, in, the, in the physical sense where, where we could only think about these, these boundaries and these rules and these limitations that we have that God doesn't have. And, and when you really think about these things that he does, it's amazing. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Our next example is in Judges chapter 6. This is the only other example I'm going to turn to because we've got a lot more to go through in Genesis. But Judges chapter 6, we're going to see Gideon. Gideon was chosen by God to, to, lead, to lead the people and, and, um, against the Midianites because the Midianites were oppressing them and, and God was raising up Gideon to judge the, the, the nation of Israel and to break this oppression that they had. And Gideon's kind of thinking like, well, who am I? You know, like... like how do I know that, that, that you're going to use me? He's, ask, he's asking for a sign of God again. Judges chapter 6, verse 36, it says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and if it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. So he said, okay. I'm going to be the one to save Israel. Okay, this is how I'm going to know. So he puts out this, this wool outside, right? He says, if when I wake up, there's only dew. It only gets this thing wet, but the whole rest of the ground is dry. He's like, I'll know. And it says in verse 38, And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. So it was wet. I mean, this thing, I mean, he's just wringing out the, the dew. And then it says in verse 39, And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. So he goes back to God. He says, God, okay, God, don't be angry with me, but I want to do one more thing. Because now he's probably thinking, well, there's no dew on the ground. Anyone could have came and just dumped some water on top of the fleece. Like, that wouldn't be some big miracle, right? Even though it was a miracle, he's, just, he's thinking, okay, now, now let's just do this the other way around. Because this is, this is even better. I'm going to put this outside. If there's dew everywhere else, but not on this thing, and this thing's dry, he's like, then I'll know. And that's what he does. It says, um, in verse 40, And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. And there's no way you could, you could fake that or mimic, you know, that, that you lay it out. Dew comes down on, on everything that's not covered. And it did not come down upon the fleece. So that's how he knew. These are two examples where people have, have you know, kind of tested God when, when God said he was going to do something. And they're like, okay, well, how about this? And God proves himself by doing these, these amazing miracles. And we're not going to turn to all these other examples, but I was kind of making a little list here, a short list, because there's so many of these. But, you know, in Genesis 18, he made a 90-year-old woman conceive, bear a child, and nurse that child. Having a virgin give birth to the Son of God, a huge miracle, right? Um, 
Jesus Christ healing the blind and the sick and the lame and those that were possessed with devils. Just again, and how did Jesus do it? Depart from her. Just saying things, right? Let her be healed. He, would, he even, I mean, there was a, the, um, the Italian um, soldier that, that sent people out to Jesus and said, you know, don't even come into my house. He's like, my servant is sick, but, but you are so holy. You're like, I can't even have you in my house. He's like, but, but just say the word and I know that my servant will be healed. And, he, and that's what he did. Jesus didn't even have to come. He just healed him because he had the power of God because he was God in the flesh. Raising the dead back to life. Talk about the impossible, Right? Someone's already gone and dead and dead four days as Lazarus was. Four days he was dead. Yet Jesus had the power to bring him back to life. Or even, you know, think about Moses allowing the children of Israel to pass through the Red Sea on dry land when they were being led out of Egypt and then all of a sudden defeating at the same time after they crossed through the whole armies of the Egyptian army was just covered and destroyed defeating their enemies and saving them at the same exact time through this extremely miraculous event that, humanly speaking, in our minds, and that's what they were thinking, what are we going to do? They got trapped in a corner, so to speak, because they, they, the, 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 the route that they were taking led them to where they come out of the wilderness and there's, you know, behind them is the armies and in front of them is just this big lake. They're like, what are we going to do? We're trapped. The armies of the Egyptians are going to come and destroy us now because now we have nowhere to run. Now we have nowhere to go. And in the face of the impossible, God is so big, he's able to make the impossible happen. Don't ever lose sight of how powerful God is and how impossible whatever situation you may be facing at the time may seem to you. God is able to, to perform these miracles. Yes, our God is the true God. The Bible says in Mark 9, 23, you don't have to turn there, Jesus said unto, them, unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And this is about the, the, um, when the child was possessed of devils and, and Jesus cast him out. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible. Everything. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Uh, Mark 10, 27 says, And Jesus, looking upon them, said, Seth, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. This is the Lord that we serve. This is the God that we serve. Turn back, if you would, to Genesis 18. We're going to continue on in Genesis 18, verse number 16. Or actually, verse number 15, I don't think we read that. It says, Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So Sarah's like, when, when, he, when she got called out, she's like, wait a minute, I didn't, you know, I didn't do that. And he's like, yes, you did. I know you lied. Or I, know, I know you laughed. And then verse 16 says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So Abraham's walking them out, saying, okay, you know, they, they had, they'd done eating and being refreshed. Abraham's leading them out. Verse 17, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And just, you know, I want to point this out real quick because... It, we've already missed a couple other examples like verse 13, and the Lord said unto Abraham, verse 17, and the Lord said, this is the Lord. This is God speaking directly unto Abraham. And this is why I believe this is Jesus Christ because it's a man. This is, this is someone in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who's speaking here to Abraham. Multiple times we see the Lord directly speaking to Abraham. And it's not the way that, uh, in this story, it's not the way that, you know, the word of the Lord came unto Isaiah and he spake God's words. Because God speaks to us that way through his prophets. But this is a person directly speaking to him, um, the word of the Lord, and it is the Lord that's saying these things. It's not just someone repeating God's words. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him. And look at this testimony that Abraham has of God himself. For I know him, 
that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. What a great testimony for God himself to say, you know what? This is my servant Abraham, and I know him. I know his heart. I know that he cares for his family. He's going to be a great leader. He's going to raise his family the way they ought to be raised. He's not going to depart from my words. He's going to instill in them that they need to fear the Lord even after he's gone. He understands the importance of being a father and of being a great leader and of teaching other people, look, you need to follow the Lord. We need to keep His commandments. We need to obey God. And Abraham was very good at instilling that and being a leader. We saw that before when he went to go rescue Lot. Remember his, his, his hired servants? He didn't have any children, but his hired servants had the respect for him and they believed in him and they trusted him and, and were able to follow him off into an impossible battle that yet they won against those four kings that had defeated five. And this is who Abraham was, a great example of a, of a great man of God. Did he have his shortcomings? Yes. Did he, did he have his, his moments of sin and, and lapse of faith? Yes. But what a great man of God to have that testimony where God just says, you know what, I know Abraham. He's going to do what's right. We should be striving to have that type of a testimony before God where you could have that type of integrity and personality and perseverance and steadfastness and, 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 and grounding in the truth and in God's word to where God's not even going to be worried or concerned about how you're going to teach your family and how you're going to raise your children and how you know, the, the, the legacy or whatever you're going to leave behind for them. So I know he's going to train him to do what's right. <clears throat> Let's continue reading here, verse number 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, now, I want to point this out also because I'm so sick of the people these days trying to make excuses for homosexuality because they've been brainwashed and they think, well, it's really not that bad, right? Hey, hey, I mean, how many times have you heard, well, you're a sinner too, and all sin is equal, and that, you know, they're a sinner and you're a sinner, so whatever, like, we're all just sinners anyways, the homosexuals, they need Christ just like us, and all this other stuff, and they just downplay the severity of that sin. They want to downplay it and treat it as if it's the same thing as, like, telling a white lie, and just say, oh, yeah, well, they're both sins. So committing some extremely wicked, disgusting, perverted act that's completely unnatural is just exactly the same as, oh, I came home from this pen from work today and I stole it and I'm going to keep it. That those two are exactly on the same, this same thing. In God's eyes, it's all the same. Well, what do we see here in verse 20, what we just read? And the Lord said, so this is again God speaking, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. Their sin is very, it's not just grievous. It's not, it's not their sin. Well, their sin is just like everybody else's in the world. No, the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah is very grievous. It's very bad. Hey, what they're doing is extremely wicked. And as we'll find out later, I mean, we already see here he's planning on destroying it. And Abraham knows this. And that's when Abraham starts negotiating with God, saying, look, God, you know, can, can you spare the city? And God is so extremely merciful that he's willing to spare the city for 10 people. You think about an entire city. We're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities, really. But he's just saying in Sodom, you know, if, if 10 people, if we just find 10 people. Ten people is not a lot, folks. An entire city. Ten saved people. The city was so wicked, so very grievous and exceeding sinful that God destroys it with fire and brimstone from heaven. Supernaturally, just, just 
fire rain. I mean, how often do you have you seen fire raining down from heaven in your lifetime? Because I've never seen it. How many times has that even happened in the Bible? Not very many. It happened to Sodom. And it says here in verse 20, their sin is very grievous. And it's so bad, it says in verse 21, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. He's saying, this is, this is so bad, i got to see this for myself. Are things really that bad in Sodom? You know, I've been hearing these things. I've been hearing, you know, the saints or whatever, crying and praying unto the Lord about how bad and how wicked Sodom is, but is it really that bad? Now look, did God really have to do that as if God didn't know? No, but again, he's proving a point here. He's saying, you know, I'm going to just verify and make sure that things are really that bad because he's, I mean, just emphasizing of how bad things are. And things are so bad, it, it boggles my mind that people fail to realize this. The whole term of sodomy that is in use today in the English language is derived from this city of Sodom. And people always want to say, oh, like, well, what about lesbians? They're not Sodom. Yes, they are Sodomites because Sodomites were the people of Sodom. That's where the word Sodomite comes from. It's not from something like they say, oh, well, what if a man and a woman commit sodomy? With no. That's not, well, I don't care what the dictionary says the word sodomy means because sodomites are people that are from Sodom that had this wickedness. That's what, that's what the word sodomite means. It's these people who have rejected God and have just become so base that they have men with men and women with women doing those things which are against nature and doing those things which are unseemly and doing those things which are abominable in the sight of God. That's what a sodomite is. So does that include women? Yes. Does that include men? Yes. It's sodomites, the people of Sodom. That's what it's talking about. And it's extremely wicked. And God had to even go and see for himself. Is it really this bad? Have they gotten that low? Is it that perverted and that disgusting? Yes, it is. Verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Again, before the Lord, right? God is there speaking to Abraham. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? So this is the argumentation that Abraham starts to use with God. He's saying, well, wait a minute, God. You know, if there's righteous people there, I mean, you're just going to destroy this whole city and you're going to destroy the righteous people and the wicked people at the same time? I mean, you're just going to lay that out and, and, and let these, these righteous people die? He says, uh, verse 24, Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? He's saying, look, God, I mean, what if there's like 50 people there? 50 people that are, that are, that are righteous, they're saved. Are you going to let them all be destroyed? Because there's these other wicked people that, that are there? And God answers and he says, you know what? No, I won't. He says, that be far from thee, verse 25, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So God's saying, No, I won't. I won't do it. And Abraham just keeps on whittling it down, like, Well, okay, you know, you won't do it for fifty, but what if what if there's only five people that are lacking? I mean, forty five, you know, like what what if there's only ten, ten less people? You know, there's still righteous people there, but just not quite 50. And he said, well, well, maybe just not quite for, you know, and he keeps on bringing it down. Like, well, come on, God, where are you going to draw the line? Is it, you know, 50, 40, 30? And he gets all the way down to 10. And that's kind of indicative of, of the type of uh, Christian that Lot was, because we know that Lot was saved. The Bible says that... Um, that Lot was just. And, you know, I'll just turn there in 2 Peter chapter number 2. In verse number 6, it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, conde condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, 
and delivered just Lot. Now, it doesn't mean it, they, he delivered only Lot because he delivered Lot and his two daughters and his wife, right? Those are all who came out of the city. But the word just means that he was just before God. He was justified because he was saved. That's what makes Lot just. And it says, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man, there he's called him righteous. Now we know how righteous Lot was, humanly speaking, or physically speaking, as far as following and obeying God. I mean, his daughters got him drunk. There was, there was children created as a result of that. He, you know, I mean, all of these different things that happened. Lot was not your poster child for, for Christianity or for, for following God. Okay? But he was righteous and he was just because he was saved, because he put his faith in the Lord. That's what makes him just. Just the same thing that makes us righteous and just today is putting our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He knew what they were doing was perverted and sick and wrong because he had the Holy Ghost inside of him. Just like any Christian today should know that homosexuality is perverted and sick and disgusting and wrong and weird and abnormal because the Holy Ghost tells us so because we are righteous and we are just through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, it's sad because he obviously wasn't a soul winner. Now, you could either say that he wasn't a soul winner or that they were all just reprobates. Now, before a person turns reprobate, there is an opportunity for them to get saved, so he wasn't doing a very good job because he lived there for quite a while before this happened. I mean, think about even just from the time that he was taken captive and all that other stuff happened. I mean, this isn't, this, we read these chapter after chapter, but it's not like these are happening day after day after day in sequence. There's, there's plenty of years that are passing in between these events, many years that are, that are passing between these events. And um, I mean, you know that Ishmael wasn't even born yet when, he, when, Lot, when Abraham went out to go save Lot. And that was, he was 13 when he got circumcised just in the previous chapter. So, I mean, we're talking 14 years probably. So, I mean, somewhere around there, 15 years maybe, whatever. Um, since then, Lot's not getting people saved because there's no righteous people there. There's no one that's just. And shame on Lot for that. But we know for a fact that there were not 10 people that were saved in that city because... God already said he wouldn't have destroyed it if there was. And there wasn't. And um, unfortunately, it says, so it says here and, uh, in verse 32, he's, he's done, he's getting done haggling with God and, and knocking him down on, on the number here. He says in verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham and Abraham returned unto his place. So then God's just like, done. He's not going to let him get it any lower than 10. Right? I mean, what's he going to do? Say five? You know, it, it, enough is enough with God. And it gets to the point where God is willing to destroy an entire city when it gets to be too corrupt and too wicked. And, and that's what we're seeing happening today. And this is why I preach judgment. This is why I preach um, you know, that, that judgment is coming on America. We need to be out there more than ever winning souls, trying to get people saved because we want to stay this type of a judgment. We don't want this to happen. We want to be able to live in a world that we're, we're not going to be um, around this, this wrath being poured out. But God will not tolerate all of this wickedness to, to occur. He didn't tolerate it in the, in the days of Sodom. And as we saw in 2 Peter chapter 2, those are in samples. Those are examples that those later that would, that would want to live ungodly like that. He said, look, this is written for you. This is kept down. This is in the Bible for you to have an example. And this country is really stupid and can't learn from history with this open acceptance in Christianity. I mean, of all people who should know the Bible, people who claim the name of Christ are telling me you shouldn't be focused on that. Oh, they're just, oh, just preach love. Oh, love your neighbor. No, I don't want the world to be, I don't want our country to be destroyed. I don't want the judgment coming down. 
You people need to wake up and realize how filthy and wicked this is. Their sin was very grievous according to the Bible. Don't tell me all sin is the same because it's not. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for what a great example Abraham was, dear Lord, and how loving and compassionate he was and how hospitable he was, dear God. I pray that you would please help us not to be grudging when, um, when people want to come up and visit and, um, or, or whatever. When, well, anytime we have visitors come through here, dear Lord, help us to have a, a very um, loving heart, one that's, that's charitable and, and hospitable to being able to provide for the needs of those that would come here. And God, I pray to please also help us not to be fooled by the wicked works of Satan and his, and his brainwashing tactics that are going on today and trying to teach people that, that homosexuality or sodomy is not that big of a deal and it's just some regular sin. When you said in the Bible that it was very grievous, dear Lord, I pray to please help us to um, never turn our backs on other brothers or sisters that are making a stand for you and that we wouldn't be ashamed of other people when the attacks come their way um, for making a stand for righteousness and for your word and for holiness, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah, along those same lines, I don't know if you guys heard about that. And, and, you know, these things are happening probably all over the place, but just every once in a while, one will catch the news or catch my eye. There was a, um, uh, I don't know if it was like Michigan or Minnesota, some guy that was running an auto shop. I think it was called Diesel Tech. And uh, he had posted something on Facebook about people who come in open carrying will receive like a 10% discount or something. And he says, no, this is not to apply to police officers that are, you know, in their uniform for, for doing their job, whatever. This is for people exercising their Second Amendment rights. They say, we appreciate that and we're going to give you a discount. And he also said that they, have, they reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, um, that if there is some just open sodomites that come in, that they're not going to... They're not, they're not allowed in their, in their store, that they're not going to serve them. And he says, you know, if, if, the, homo, if the homosexual comes in and they, you know, and, they, and they bring in their car, yeah, they'll work on it, they'll get it done or whatever. But if you're just going to be blatantly just, you know, displaying all the, you, their, their gayness and, and being flaming about it, then no, they're not going to. Because they believe it's wicked and sin and they shouldn't be promoting that and they, they don't support that. And so this guy now has gotten tons of, like, way, like I got a little bit of persecution last week. This guy's getting the death threats and they came and like, like vandalized his shop. They vandalized cars that were there. They were saying bash back and all this other stuff. And that's when they start to show their true colors that when you start reading Romans 1, that they're fierce, that they're wicked, and as we're going to see in Genesis later on, how aggressive and predatory and, and, and really evil and um, violent they are. Proving our, point. Proving our point. That's who, that is who they are. And the devil's deceiving people into thinking that's not who they are. And you, you say it to someone, oh, they're not all like that. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They're hiding it from you. But that is what they're like. Because when they're, when the more there are of them, the more bold they're going to get in, in being able to come out with how wicked and vile they truly are. That's why they get so extremely bad in their gay pride parades and stuff, because they're all together. They've got a big a mass of people together and they get more bold. So the, the more people side with them and join their cause and, you know, and whatever, and the more people they recruit, the more bold they get. And that's why they got so bold in the days of Lot to just be pounding on the guy's door because it infected the entire city. They won't always be doing those things when they can't when they're just completely in the closet like they have been for decades in this country you don't hear about it as much they're not doing as much but the more tolerated and accepted it becomes the more bold they get and the more vile and evil things they're gonna 
be surfacing. Now, they always did the wicked things, but it was all kept under wraps and on the down low, and they, won't, you know, they don't want it to, to let you know how wicked and evil they really are. But it comes out, and it comes out in events like this. So, thank God that there's people saying up. Hopefully, he doesn't buckle, because it's tough to, to deal with that sometimes. And, you know, especially, you know, you got a family, you're getting death threats and stuff like that. That's, that's, why, that's why when the celebrities say something against homos, you always see them retracting their statement. One, because it's either going to hurt their pocketbook, which is n normally the case. The, someone, someone will threaten them that is able to get to them and say, you're not going to make any more money unless you apologize. Because there are evil forces at work that don't want any big names going against this agenda. And they will, and I mean, that's why they went after Pastor Anderson and, and destroyed his career, his business. And that's what they're trying to do with this guy. They're trying to get him to get scared, to cower down, and to, and to apologize. And, but see, the problem is, once you've already said it, like, you can't apologize or else you lose all credibility and then no one takes you serious. You cannot back down, ever. Resist the devil and he will fl uh, flee. But during the hard times, you have to resist.